Alpha. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens right here with Crypto Banter in Dubai, in real life, after many years of being deep, deep in this industry. Welcome, here from Arthur Hayes, Telegram, Sue, Eigenlayer, Athena, Anson, Near, VCs, Exchanges, and much more. We care about freedom. We started building in 2021. And I'm a correspondent for Crypto Banter. And you want to get more people into blockchain, right? Absolutely. Today I'm gathered with four legends in the investment ecosystem. Do your own research, go to the data, and understand what it means. Here we are in Dubai. And unlike some crypto bros, we never got liquidated by the rain. We're here for Token 2049, and it's going to be the biggest event of the year. Over 10,000 people and tons of alpha. Let's go. That's right. 10,000 people and tons of alpha. As always, our crypto banter team is here in full force. No other channel has the presence, the bandwidth, the sheer reach, or the power to bring you coverage like this on the ground. Just take a look here at the Medina Jumeirah, an old style sook like gathering place, gathering all the biggest names and brightest minds in our industry. So, our vision always was about empowering people to have control over their assets. It's one thing to broadcast daily, bringing you all the real-time market moves. It's another thing to be here in Dubai, a now pivotal global crypto hub at the biggest conference yet in this pivotal halving year 2024, where the bull market is in full effect. Also in effect, BitLayer. This episode proudly brought to you by the first security equivalent layer 2 solution based on the BitVM approach, launching soon. Back to Dubai, what a week it was. In effect were historic floods inundating a desert like Dubai with the years full of rain pounding the Emirates. It left conference goes flights in flux, cars abandoned, our producers wading through sidewalks, highways clogged, and chaos abound with events cancelled and conferences in question. While some traders got liquidated early in the week and the streets were still flooded, we kicked off things in the sun, coming up for air and ready for the halving. Bullish names like Arthur Hayes kicking things off. Some of you motherfuckers in here are not bullish enough. From the top one down, there were Bitcoin OGs like Roger Ver here. But we see a lot of people mislabeling cryptocurrency accounts as wallets. But others talked Bitcoin layer twos like Dovi Wan and Muneeb Ali from Stax. While Ethereum L2s made their case from the likes of Polygon, ZK Sync, and Scroll. New names are also here making a splash like Eigenlayer in the restaking space. Other high-flying tech, Athena, sitting down with us to see exactly how it works. And essentially it's capturing that yield that you're describing from the short perp position. You're usually getting paid a yield because people want to get leverage long in crypto and you're taking the other side of that position. Layer 1's were in the house including Polkadot's Gavin Wood, a core developer. Plus, Aptos and Sui here looking to onboard users, the name of the game. And if too many people are sending money back and forth, that line gets really long. Addressing big crowds were heavyweights like Jeremy Allaire from Circle and Sergey from Chainlink chiming in on all things oracles. And of course, wearing that classic shirt that never goes out of style. Just like you're not thinking about the database technology used by an application. In style, Web3 Gaming, making its presence known with Animoca, Star Atlas, Immutable X, all making roads to mass adoption. I'm feeling personally extremely excited. Let's talk about navigating the new frontier of meme coins. Over on the Zebu stage, Raj, Binance's global BD head, MCing, introing well, me. This is no holds barred. We're going to talk about the ins and outs of meme coins. We're going to talk about, we're going to go deep into meme coins. So I think probably that's a good place to start because I was also skeptical in the beginning and now I'm not skeptical anymore. Also taking the stage and powering the industry, the exchanges, Binance, BingX, CoinW, and HTX with Justin Sun debating what the future looks like for the asset class. The market is so big. The main sponsors throwing their weight around commanding attention. KuCoin trying to find the next gen. BingX and CoinW with massive presence. Bitkit, Bybit, Gate, Coinstore, Whitebit, Femix, all right here. And don't forget Binance hosting its own offsite next door with their partners Eternity. But in my opinion, uh, strength is shown when the bear market is here, not when the bull market is here. Also crashing the party, Ansem in town promoting crypto fight night. And on a panel with heavyweights like Dragonfly, we sparred intellectually with. So then should we be looking at fully diluted valuations? The release schedule is the thing that you care about, not the FTV, okay? Top VCs were around and they were deploying, including some of the biggest funds in the world like Hash from Korea, Pantera from San Francisco, 
and Maelstrom, Arthur Hayes' new fund, making huge waves in Dubai. Arthur was certainly celebrating like it's a bull market, hosting his own party at the famed surf club the night before. Opening it, referencing how hard he partied. Arthur, bro, I read all of your sub stacks. I read your last one. And when I finished reading it, I almost dumped all my altcoins and went into Athena. That's, that, that's how negative it was. I take it you're still long-term bullish though, right? Absolutely. Tell me about why you were short-term back into cash. Yeah, and I have defined cash as study Bitcoin, Ethereum, like my very core position holdings, which I'm, I'm perfectly happy to weather that volatility, and uh, USDE, the Athena stablecoin. So why? Because tax season in the US. So tax season, one good reason? Bitcoin having. Everybody, you know, has been hyping up Bitcoin having, Bitcoin having, Bitcoin having. I believe there was a sell the news event and Bitcoin is going to pre-trade that and get weaker as we get into the having. Now, obviously, I believe post having will resume the uptrend, but I thought about this particular time was perfect for Bitcoin to experience a little bit of a slump. And so on balance, negative dollar liquidity, sell the news event on the halving. I thought this is a perfect opportunity for me to lighten up a bit. So now the halving is, by the time this episode comes out, the halving is going to be behind us. Tax season is behind us. We've had a little bit of a correction. Altcoins are down 50%. Bitcoin, 10, 20%. Time to get back in the market. Time to start scaling in or too fast, too soon. Absolutely. I think this is the, the summer chop period. I don't think we're going from 60,000 to 100,000 anytime soon. I think we're going to chop around these levels. If you're a day trader, it's going to be very difficult to be trend following and make money. But for me, it's going to give me time to scale back into the positions that I'm really, really confident about and that now are you know, 20, 30% off in the altcoin space. And so I'm very happy that I have this free cash available. I'm going to scale into things that I want to get ready for the Q3, Q4 of this year when shit starts to get real. So one of the things in Q3, Q4 this year is elections. Yes. On the stage, you spoke about the importance of the elections and getting people to vote. Tell me, play out your thesis for me in terms of rates and how it's going to play out. So if you're talking about the US election, uh, Trump or Biden, it doesn't matter which one of these clowns wins the election. They both are campaigning on, I will spend money and hand it out to you, my supporter. They're going to find ingenious ways to print money to hold down government bond rates. And what does that do? That generates negative real yields globally. And thus, crypto booms, stocks boom, real estate booms. Okay. So last time we had you on the, on the show was Token 2049 in Singapore. You left us with a few nuggets. You said Bitcoin, AI, Filecoin. AI went through the roof, Filecoin doubled or tripled. I'm putting you on the spot again. You said you were gonna load up your bags for Q3 and Q4. What are you putting in the bags? Pendle. My number one pick right now is Pendle. Tell me why. And I believe that Pendle is going to be the most important derivatives decentralized exchange out there because it is powering the next wave of our evolution as a market, which is interest rates trading. If you think about the largest market in the world is the interest rate trading market. On the CME, the Euro dollar futures contract trades however many quadrillion notional every year. That's the real prize. Pendle is bringing us interest rate trading to DeFi native crypto protocols so we can create a farm to table economy in crypto and so I can borrow money I can lend money and I know what rate I should be trading and I can hedge it. That's what Pendle is and doing. you can trade your rates. Exactly. And I believe Pendle is the future and that's why I will be... I smile because I'm an investor. What else, are you, what else are you putting in the bags? What else am I putting in the bags? Obviously, I love Athena. I think that it's going to take the top spot of Tether over time. Not, not overnight. Meme coins? I, I mean, I know you Meme bring... coins, wizards. BRC20, uh... ordinals. We're bringing culture to Bitcoin. I like the wizards. I got an honorary wizard. I own the wizard. Meme coins, net good or net bad for the space? Absolutely excellent. They bring real economic activity to a chain. Solana, it's going down. The TPS is bullshit. Why? Because people brought culture to Solana and people are using it. Now, I don't care if you don't like the cats or the dogs or you think it's bullshit tech or bullshit JPEGs. People are using it. They're spending real money to use your protocol to trade culture. Culture is the most important thing that we have as a human economy. We bring that to Bitcoin, it's just gonna go nuts. Okay, thank you very much, my friend. Thank you. Love it, thank you, bro. Culture and Bitcoin. Wow, just imagine the possibilities. Right. That was awesome. Also ever imagining is Ilya from Near Protocol. He was recently on stage with Jensen Hung from NVIDIA back to his native AI roots and trying to tie blockchain and AI together. Of course, writing the narrative. Ilya, um, a lot of people would say that you guys have had an amazing change of direction and all of a sudden you're in this AI stream. 
Is that a, well, how do you see it? Is it a change of direction or? No, I, I mean, so our vision always was about empowering people to ha have control over their assets, data, and power of choice, right? And so data always was about AI. And, uh, you know, Near, AI, Near started as AI company back as Near AI. It was about crowdsourcing, data labeling, data collection as well. We were teaching machines to code. And so for us, really, this is just like, bringing back uh, some of the pieces that we've always had on a roadmap, but now that a lot of the AI tooling is working better and we have a clear strategy on how to bring it together, we, I, I said it you know, full steam ahead now. It's not a chain of direction, it's full steam ahead in the direction we already were going. Here, actually in past couple of months shown that we can actually grow capacity, add more shards, and keep fees low. So we've proven the whole thesis where we started near blockchain itself, and now, now that we have this infrastructure that enables, you know, potentially billions of users, you know, billions of AGI, AI agents, payments, all of this. Payments are on near, it's uh, two tenths of a cent per transaction, right? It's, it's cheaper than Stripe. For microtransactions, this is cheaper than Stripe. We have projects switching from Stripe to use near to do payments because it's 100x cheaper than Stripe for, for small transactions because you pay 30, 30 cent fee. So now we have this infra that enables ownership, identity, payments, like coordination, facilitation. And so a lot of the AI efforts now are using this, right, to now expand and provide interfaces, coordinate compute, and also starting advancing the, some of the original ideas we had around how to teach machines to code, how to advance reasoning. Yeah, you said that the infrastructure is built. What's missing? What's next? And where will that lead us? Yeah, so I outlined this in January. It was called a fully sovereign operating system, right? So sovereign operating system is about us as a user being in control, right? It's not like right now you open your phone, it's Google, Microsoft, Apple, you know, and a bunch of startups which are like, you know, run, yeah, it's super centralized. And so what I want is user data, my data, stays on my device. I mean, it should be replicated and encrypted, but like it stays on my device. And I have an AI that is able to reason and use it as a context to solve my problems, right? And even furthermore, generate applications for me on the fly, right? So this is really where we're going. Where we're going is it's a fully user-owned operating system where AI model, all your context, private data, and your blockchain facilitation payment, all of this working together to provide a completely novel experience, right? So Nier has been building a lot of this infra, actually like private data, Calimera have been working on this, Kaichin, Cosmos has been working on this, right? All of these pieces have been built like even before this AI hype started, right? The uh, kind of some of the facilitation of this as well. So like all of these pieces, the front ends, the decentralized front ends we talked about, blockchain, yes. everything. This is, this is all part of the same vision. Like because to generate applications, you need like to wait a way to have decentralized applications and a way to generate training data for gen for doing this. So this is what uh, all of that was about. It was to create decentralized front ends and then being able to generate them on a fly for the user. Is it this year? Is it three I think years? It's this from year, now? yeah. I think we'll see some. So like we we've seen, for example, Hot, which is like grew from zero to five million users in three months. What right? is it? It's a Telegram wallet that uses near that is enabling you now to use Near in very chain abstracted way, and you can then soon to be used other blockchain as well, right? Extremely fast growth in Web3. Now Web3 has growth engines that Web2 doesn't even have. And so pair that with AI, pair that with some of this user ownership, private data, better context. Imagine when you're asking the model, it actually has a lot more context about you. Now, you don't want to give this context to ChatGPT, right? You don't want to like upload your bank statements to ChatGPT. But if it's a model that runs on your side, if it's your edge model, so we will see some of this happening. Like, I, I mean, already a bunch of startups working on pieces of this. So you own your data, the AI is working on data that you own, you're not sharing the data with any centralized entity at any time, but you're getting all the benefits of the of the data in the, from, from the AI. Sorry, it's the context, yeah, so the AI is aware of all this when it's doing it. And you think that that's within 12 months? I think so, yeah. That's insane. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and, yeah, um, yeah. and again, we're, we're, yeah. we're long-term holders and we're, we're here to stay, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. That's the big question. What will be here to stay? One of the blockchains that broke away from Facebook's DM project was Sui. It's been an Aptos Sui race of sorts, but now Sui is all in on gaming and probably well in the lead. So I've been following you guys for a while. As you know, I'm an investor. I followed you guys to Paris. 
I must say I was quite taken aback by how much progress had been made since you launched to Paris. Like, just walk me through some milestones of, of where we got to. So we, we started our platform, we started building in 20, 2021. We focused like really hard on building the best developer experience in Web3. Um, if you speak to any builder who's building on SWE now, they're saying it's a 10x improvement. So in fact, a lot of the growth is organic from the ecosystem itself. People are building, they're realizing they can build better applications, things are much faster, they can make more money in SWE, and then they're bringing a lot more devs into the ecosystem. When you say that it's a better experience, yeah. like, give me like three or four things where, like when you look at SWE and you compare it to other blockchains, yeah. you say, look, that's a much better experience and no one has that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can give you three things. First thing, in SWE you think of objects, and most programming languages in the world use objects. So it means most developers are going to be very comfortable building in SWE. That's the first thing. Easy to build safe applications in SWE. Second, we give them low level primit um, primitives that make it easier to build better, better apps. ZK Login, for example. With ZK Login, anyone can create an account with a Google account, Facebook account, WhatsApp account, doesn't matter, on chain. And you can do that with full privacy. So it means you can onboard millions, if not billions of users without having to introduce them to crypto. Without having to do private key management. Private key management, any of those things. And the third thing is, on SWE, we abstract away gas. So you can use apps in SWE using your, e log in with your email and you transact without ever knowing gas exists. So we think that experience makes SWE very different. And we're seeing applications build on SWE using all those primitives. Is it right to say that you guys are slightly leaning towards gaming? So I can, I can answer that in two parts. One, the three things we focus on is gaming, commerce, and finance. But we believe gaming is where you bring the most amount of users, fast, right? So we think, as I was explaining, there are over 3.3 billion gamers in the world who account to almost $200 billion spent a year. That's more than film, more than um, uh, entertainment as a whole. We want to bring those users to Web3 and allow them to benefit from the element of ownership. But we still think SWE is the best place to trade. If you speak to Bluefin, who were originally in Arbitrum, they moved over to SWE and tested SWE and Arbitrum at the same time. Traders were 20x more profitable in SWE than Arbitrum. Let's talk about something that, I want to call it the elephant in the room, but when you have blockchains, a lot of blockchains have really intense communities. Like, I think fair also to say that your initial community building efforts weren't like amazing. Yeah. How do you plan to catch up the, the lost ground? Um, we are late in the sense that we started later than everybody else, but we don't think the game is won yet. There are only 15 to 20,000 devs in the whole of Web3. Facebook had more developers than Web3, period. We've built a programming language that 9 million devs who write in JavaScript can get to grips with instantly. So we are going after a bigger market than Solana, ETH, EVM, and all these other chains. We think we'll get the biggest community in the entire Web3 ecosystem. It's just a fun function of time. People are now starting to learn about SWE. If you look at the apps in SWE, some of the apps in our ecosystem have more TVL than other L1s, right? There's more trading volume in one of our DeFi protocols than there is on the entire of Aptos. Um, or even, uh, in fact, we have more volume than Avalanche, trading volume than Avalanche on our DeFi protocols. A lot of people compare you guys to Aptos because you know, your two teams broke away. I guess you're both insiders at Facebook, broke away, went two separate ways, used the same language. How do you feel about the comparison? Like when people say, hey, like a Sui or Aptos, It's not even one? close. Not even, okay. First, our team, superior in every single way, right? Like if you look at the people who built Libra, who invented all the technology, the core contributors, the inventor of Move, they're in so Liston. Sam is the inventor of Move. And Sam is your CTO. He's our CTO. He's the one that's innovated to even take Move to the next level. So if you think about talent compared to Aptos, we're not even the same. Separately, our stack, we, when we left Facebook, we built a brand new system. We did not take the code we built at Facebook, we built a brand new system. Aptos just used the code that we had at Libra and improved it somewhat. And we think it's a meaningful improvement, but we don't think it takes you to billions of users. Aptos launched almost a year before we did, and we have more TVL, more volume, more users, more real engaged users on platform than they do. So I think our propensity to growth, propensity to grow our ecosystem, it supersedes what they have. So I don't actually see Aptos as a comp comparison. What do you think will be the first mass uptake app on, on the platform? You must, have, you must be quite plugged into what's happening on the ecosystem. Oh, yeah. yeah. Any horses in the race? So there, there are actually many. So as you, as you know, chains only be live for 11 months and the breakout apps are actually coming. One app to look out for is Fan TV, that has um, already got over 600 monthly active users that are already engaging, sharing content, using content, um, creating videos and sharing videos and, and monetizing as a result. 
Thank you, my friend. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for your support. We'll be following you. We'll see you at the next conference. We've also been following the super interesting Athena, building a new kind of stablecoin. It launched with a huge valuation taking the market by storm, but let's understand exactly how they work. So just maybe explain for users how this thing actually works. Uh, you're essentially just swapping, uh, let's say, USDC or USDT. Uh, that's coming into the Athena's front end, and that's basically buying with that money, buying Bitcoin and then shorting Bitcoin on the other side, or buying ETH and then shorting it on the other side, and then issuing USDE to the user back in return. And essentially, it's capturing that yield that you're describing from the short perp position. You're usually getting paid a yield because people want to get leverage long in crypto, and you're taking the other side of that position, essentially. So, so you're completely hedged? E exactly, yeah. What's the risk? The biggest risk, I think, uh, and this is like applies to all type of like stable coin assets. I think where the assets are not actually residing on chain is custodial risk. So, as we saw with like SVB at the beginning of 23, there is real custodial risk to like a USDC or USDT, which is are the banks who are holding the underlying assets solvent and like there, there's like a credit risk that's actually there. We thought that that was risk free before, and we learned that it wasn't. Um, SVB, we learned it wasn't. Exactly. Um, uh, we haven't like uh, solved that risk. We basically transferred custodial risk from like the US banking system into crypto itself because the assets are sitting uh, with institutional grade custodians and you have the positions sitting on centralized exchanges. So you do have this risk that you're facing counterparties on the other side, but it's very different to the type of counterparties that you see with normal stablecoin. A lot of people are saying that actually on the other side, you're actually very good for the market because you're, you're acting as a stabilizer of of lending and borrowing rates. Right. It's a really interesting idea to think about uh, if funding rates would have been at like 40 without Athena and we push them down to 10, for example, uh, that actually allows more people to come in and get, get long at cheaper leverage, right? And so there's this really interesting flywheel where you're bringing down the cost of capital within crypto and actually making it cheaper for everyone else to get long. And so this has like a really nice like flywheel in the derivative market. Is there a flip side that could say, well, you're reducing rates on crypto and I hate you because I was making 40%. And will it reduce the, the, the yield on the stablecoin at some point? Yeah, and uh, the yield will come down through time, but uh, that's what happens in every financial market where you identify that there's a super normal return to be made, you put capital into it and you bring it down to a return that, that makes sense. And that is where the value is created. It's not attractive anymore. Sure, but there's, uh, there's also people who, some people are happy with 40%, some people are happy with 20 or 15, whatever that number is. We're going to work out what that level is for a dollar return within the market. I think what you're saying is crypto DJs enjoy it now because in a couple of years, it's not going to be as exciting for, for crypto DJs. I think so, uh, but I think it'll always have a spread to like other yields in the market. So uh, it is a riskier product, I think, than like a T-bill, uh, which is like essentially risk-free. And so I don't think it ever makes sense that that rate goes below like five, five and a half percent. Uh, so I sort of see it as like a spread to that product. And people who want to get a higher return versus RWAs, there'll be some equilibrium where this like product like matches out. Yeah, good to see you. We'll keep following what you guys are doing. Thanks, man. Let's hope it's business as usual soon enough. Now let's talk narratives and deepen with one of the most promising projects in the space, Ionet. They're focused on AI and decentralized GPUs, and they've just raised a hell of a lot of money. Let's see how they're going to put it to use. So one of the big discussions is this decentralized GPU narrative. And the big question that I have for myself is, are they ever going to solve the GPU shortage? I think the shortage will always be there because we have only scratched the surface of what's possible with GPU cards. Like for example, I had a conversation with uh, a, like a friend who works at, Amazon, uh, at Facebook, at Meta, and he said, we have more than a billion active users a day. Imagine if we have enough compute power, we would build a machine learning model for each one of the users. So we can even generate the ads for him specifically, draw it the way he likes it, uh, make videos for the way he likes it. Billion users, a billion GPU, there's no billion GPUs. No. So what you're saying is, you're saying that right now we are creating more use cases for GPUs quicker than they can keep up with GPU production. Yes, even if we don't create more use cases, the demand is two and a half times more than the supply. So imagine, so, imagine expanding use cases more, it's, it's a problem. There are a lot of projects that are tackling this. There's uh, Ionet, which of course we're investors, so full disclosure. Um, you've got uh, GPU.net, you've got Akash, you've got AOS, you've got Render. Tell me what you guys are doing different. Well, first of all, like, we are 100 times bigger than the, than the largest competitor in the market. And what metric? By GPU supply. And that GPU supply is not just like consumer GPUs. We're talking about, we have 150, 160,000 RTX 4090. We have 40,000 A100. 
our infrastructure right now total value is crossed 4.5 billion dollar first of all like we were, we were working on this so the IO coin is going to be launched really soon and basically the way the coin is designed is there is an hourly emission reward for the providers of compute and that reward is distributed across the providers based on how how many GPUs they have and how good the GPUs are uh, so that incentivized because there's the airdrop coming it's, it's, it's plus 600 million dollar airdrop so because of that airdrop you know everyone in the industry we took everyone like we took over the world that's it <laughs> from GPU supply in the crypto community right now we are getting GPU supply from data centers corporates like those who even never heard of crypto so when you come onto the market you're gonna be the biggest decentralized GPU provider out there by a long a long way 100 times well 100 times when we had 40,000 400,000 GPUs now we had a million bigger than render well, well I mean technically yeah of course and when are you guys coming to market? First week of May, hopefully. All right, well, we'll be watching first week of May, guys. First week of May, well, let's see. Perfect to get their perspective on all launches and narratives, Dragonfly Capital, one of the smartest VCs in the space. How are you feeling about the energy of the market cycle? So yeah, we had a dip in the last couple of days, but in general, are you feeling like there's a lot of pent up energy for a huge bull market? I'm getting 20, 17 vibes. I'm getting 2020 vibes of like that pre-explosion energy. How are yeah. you feeling? I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, letting a little bit of air out is always healthy uh, in, in the course of a bull run, but I don't know anybody who thinks that the bull run's over, right? It's very clear, no matter what's happening, you know, potential war in the Middle East or rates higher for longer, the market is stopping, digesting. Great, let's keep going. So that's the feeling right now. Yeah. What are the narratives that you're looking at? So right now, I mean, so obviously the macro narratives you've got You've got, you know, what's going on in the world, you've got the U.S. election, you've got, you know, the Fed, uh, and you've got the Bitcoin happening, right? These are kind of the big macro backdrops. The micro, you've got things like restaking, you've got Bitcoin L2s, you've got crypto AI. These seem to be the things that are driving a lot of the, the market anticipation. On the VC side, which is my bread and butter, that's where I'm seeing a lot of the really crazy valuations, a lot of money chasing deals. That's where most of the energy is on the, on the early stage startup side. So, when this market started dipping, I said that it's got nothing to do with the retaliation. It's got more to do with the structure of the market cycle. And I said that the market cycle is such where tokens are being released into the market at a cra the vesting schedules are starting to be released into the market at a crazy rate. Yeah. There's no one to absorb the token supply. The second problem is that the VCs are bidding up projects before they get onto market. So in the old days, you'd get a project that raises at a $30 million valuation, yeah. comes to market and gives retail some legroom. Today I'm seeing projects that are off market at one billion. Yeah. And then when they get to the market, there's just no space for the retail investor to bid these things up. Right. How healthy do you think the market structure is? Um, so we, it's only the, the implication of your question is that if we launch tokens with lower FTVs or lower initial prices, then retail would be able to capture some of the upside, right? The reality is if you have a token that's worth a billion and everyone agrees that it's worth a billion, if you launch it at hundred million, in 10 minutes it's gonna go to a billion. Right? And it's not retail that's going to capture that, it's going to be the people on Binance in the first 10 minutes. Okay? At the end of the day, if you have an asset that everybody agrees that it's supposed to be worth a billion, it's going to be priced at a billion no matter what happens. Okay? Now, tokens launching earlier in their product development cycle may solve that problem. Right? If, 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 if VCs don't have to wait, or not VC, sorry, if retail doesn't have to wait until a token actually goes to mainnet and has a token ready for launch, then they could get in at 100 million or 150 million when there's still a lot of tech uncertainty, right? But the reality is that the reason why you can't do that is not because of VCs, it's because of the SEC. So, so then should we be looking at fully diluted valuations? The release schedule is the thing that you care about, not the FTV, okay? What is the FTV? FTV is every token that will ever be minted multiplied by the current price, okay? Here's why that is not the right number to care about. Because, one, you want to see the supply curve in release. How much is the team? How much is the investors? How much is the natural inflation of the token from staking rewards, right? And then how much is the treasury? How much is for LP rewards? How much is for this and that? And those things release over time. The question is on a percentage basis. If you're a retail investor and you're coming to market and you've got to buy a token, or if yeah. Hasib is buying a token on the open market, how do you look at FTV? So when I look at FTV, I want to understand what is that FTV composed of? Right? FTV, again, is a compression of that chart that we're talking about. Right? You look at that chart and you see what is the percentage increase in one year, two years, three years? What's your holding period? Second, you look at what are those components? Of course, token, not all investors are created the same. So you see, okay, investors are unlocking 5%. Who are those investors? 
Are these pump and dump Chinese funds? Or is this you know, A16Z? Well, that's going to mean a very different holding period for those different kinds of investors and very different sell pressure over the period of time. So all these things, again, you compress all that down into one number, but it, 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 um, it loses a lot of information. And that information is what you really care about in understanding what is going to happen in the supply and demand dynamics of this token. So we have been talking about FTV for a long time. Uh, I guess that you've now heard another opinion. <laughs> I still think that it's a big minefield for retail investors to, to navigate. Of course, but all these things are huge minefields. That's why you have to go to the data. Do your own research, go to the data and understand what it means. Go to the data and do your own research. From the funds, let's talk to one of the many abundant exchanges here at Token 2049. M2 is a fully licensed exchange operating out of Abu Dhabi, an area promising crypto-friendly regulation. You guys are one of the big exchanges here in, the, in this region. Uh, not, not very big globally, but in this region, all you hear about is M2. What, what exactly is M2? So M2 is a fully regulated exchange here based out of Abu Dhabi. We offer everything around spot futures training as well as investment possibility. And how stringent is the process to become regulated? Extremely stringent. I, I'd say it's, it's one, of, one of the stringest in the world, but that, and that's, that's painful and a long-term thing to go through. It took us two years, but as a result, we, we know it's, it's, it's top-notch quality, it's robust, and our customer assets are protected. That's, that's what it comes down to. Does it feel like they're putting you in the same basket as the traditional banks? So what I'm asking is, yeah. I'm trying to understand whether they have a new framework for crypto or whether they're saying, look, just treat this as a bank, give them the same KYCs, the same AMLs, the same lending borrowing restrictions, or are they saying, hold on, there's this new asset class, it's called crypto, we need to treat this like a new asset class. I would think the, because I'm, I'm also an ex-banker, I, I used, used to be the CEO of a bank, I would think the, the requirements are very, very similar by now. Uh, c certainly the AML requirements, the onboarding KYC are 100%, they're basically identical. Um, and then in terms of how the exchange is managed, free and orderly trading, transparency, listing process. I mean, the listing process itself is obviously slightly different to an exchange because it's, it's tokenized assets or digital assets. But the, the, how the exchange is run, I think it's very, very similar to traditional finance. Do you feel that there is really that big pot of money here in this region that is looking to invest in crypto? I'd say absolutely yes. I mean, compared to the, the, the GDP and the population size, uh, the interest in crypto and the ability to spend uh, is, is extremely high. I see a mix of, of investment, not only in, in, in token, but in, in, in equity, right? They, they, they try to have miners, uh, shares in companies, uh, um, and, and assets more than, than just the crypto holdings. So, so you see both of that, but there's definitely enough capital on that goes around. Super exciting. Look, we'll be looking out for your progress. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Pleasure Thank to be here. Speaking of UAE, let's go to our brand new crypto banter correspondent, Lily Das. She's a well-known figure in the Dubai crypto scene, hosting any and every event panel. Lily, let's check in on the sentiment right here at Token 2049. Hi guys, I am Lily Dows here at Token 2049. I'm a correspondent for Crypto Banter. Let's go check it out. How are you enjoying being here at Token 2049? Oh, it's amazing so far. It's great. Uh, I haven't seen a, a conference of this caliber. So we have Kraken here today. We have CoinW, so much more. We need to go and check it out in the venue. Right, so we have the main sponsors here, M2 Exchange. If you guys haven't heard about them, based out of Abu Dhabi, we have CoinW, Bing X, and of course, main stage. Let's check out some of the booths. We are here with Yatsu. I bumped into you and I'm like, right, we need to have a little chat. So how are you enjoying being here at Token, Yeah, I think 24 is going to be an amazing year for Web3 and blockchain. How are you enjoying it here today? Uh, this is outstanding to be honest. So many people. I think it's like 7,000 or, or more. 10,000. 10,000, yeah. Let's go. It's been so busy here all day. This is wild. Yeah, I think crypto is just generally wild. It's, uh, it's pretty much how everyone rolls. Yes, let's do a prediction. Uh, I'd say next three months are going to be a little bit turbulent and then it's going to pop off after that. But uh, there's always value, right? Really good, coming in all the way from Hong Kong as well. So. From Hong Kong? Okay, yeah. well, lots of yeah. news has been coming out of Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. Bitcoin ETF, Ethereum ETF. Yeah. We, we will soon rival Dubai. Not yet there. Oh, we're... what else? There's so many booths. What is coming next in the industry? What's going to be booming? Well, we are standing next to it. I think it's deep in. 
deep end. How much have you guys enjoyed being here at Tokyo? A lot of serious projects here, a lot of people who are really excited and pumped for what's going to be happening in 2024. What else is happening over here? Whoa. It's always fun here in the land of crypto. It's like walking into a whole different world. Okay, that is everything over on the conference floor. It's been wild. Let's hand it back to Ran. Thanks, Lily. Great work from the floor. That leads us to take a quick break in our coverage. More from Token 2049 coming up. Remember, this special episode of Crypto Banter is brought to you by BitLayer, the first Bitcoin security equivalent layer 2 based on the BitVM approach, addressing the trade-off between trustlessness and Turing completeness on a Bitcoin layer 2 through cryptographic innovations and blockchain engineering. The intention? Foster a prosperous Bitcoin ecosystem. Launching soon. It was a massive weekend, right? As you know, we were dealt with rains, floods, blocked roads, and of course, pre-halving jitters. But by day two here at Token 2049, it was full bull again. And the halls were packed, gearing up for Telegram's big announcement. We've been big holders of time. Let's go take a look. We've been to every conference at every corner of the globe. And this was by far the most packed stage we had ever seen. It's extremely busy. Obviously, everybody's getting ready. Sorry, guys. People waiting to hear from the founder of Telegram on a public stage for the first time in 10 years. That's the tweet, and that's the news from Telegram. From the Telegram announcement, we headed back to our stage to talk more announcements and more news from promising projects. Here's Zion, pioneering chain abstraction and building its own user-centric layer one. So we just had the big announcement from Telegram. They're integrating USDT. They want to get many, many, many more users into blockchain. In fact, especially this man over here, you want to get more people into blockchain, right? Absolutely. So tell me what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. We are pioneering chain abstraction. And so what we're saying is the way to get to mainstream blockchain and adoption is to create a completely seamless experience. How are you getting more users in? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the kind of the common idea is let's make it really easy to onboard users. But I think we need to meet the users where they are. And we need to create a completely Web2 experience that leverages the benefits of Web3. And so whether that be you know, great timing with the USDT on, on uh, Telegram, but you know, we had a very big partnership with USDC to have everything denominated in stable coins. Credit card, debit card, complete, you know, complete uh, email login, social login, um, and chain abstraction so that works for any product on any chain. So, it doesn't even so, so you are in fact a layer one blockchain and yeah. you're just focusing on the user experiencing, on the user experience using chain abstraction and a whole lot of other tools. For now, and then you know that actually really quickly and then I think a little alpha here, next week we're actually launching our chain abstraction with Injective. So you can use all the benefits of Zion through or using the Injective uh, Talus NFT marketplace. And so that's exciting. Amazing, you guys have been building Zion for a long time, but you also have a history. I do. You have a history of burning. <laughs> tell us, you tell us. I have two histories of burning. First of all, about three years ago, I uh, bought a Banksy art piece. I uh, lit it on fire and sold it as an NFT. For all of 2021, we were the highest average price NFT uh, sold on OpenSea. 
Uh, and if you look at the Wikipedia, actually, we're still in the Wikipedia for the word NFT. Uh, and then more recently, I actually, safely of course, lit myself on fire uh, to announce our $25 million Series A fundraise. How do you think all the chains are going to be connected? Like, how, the, how is Injective going to be connected to, to Zion Chain? So, yeah, I mean, we, like, kind of our bread and butter is we don't really have externally owned accounts, right, which is like what you would traditionally think of a wallet as. Everything is a smart contract account, which is deployable code on chain. If we can do that and have deployable code on chain here, we could also have it on Injective, which can control a smart contract on Injective. So now take that from Injective, bring it to Nier, bring it to Solana, and then having everything all in one place. Cool. Good to see you, my brother. Yeah, and uh, we'll be wait waiting for your launch. And Great. guys, full disclosure, we are investors here. Speaking of launches, I'm not just at the Settle Day. I'm at the conference running around. Wow. Catching up with fans, projects, investors. Nice to meet you, man. And always looking at what's next. Let's go. A project from the last cycle building on Substrate is Peak, a Deepen centric layer one. Okay, now tell me why do we need a layer one chain specifically for Deepen? So we've been working with many big enterprises and realized in the past that you need a network where all those machines have an identity. When you think about the machine economy, you cannot just have a charging platform, parking platform, car sharing platform, because if they're isolated, you don't have any interoperability, composability. But if you want to have an open machine economy, they all need to have an identity on an open system where they can pay for goods and services, where they can authenticate and so on. So this is where the idea and the vision came from. So we're like, we're building a layer one for IoT with IoT backend functionalities, which is now called Deepen. And then Deepen builders can build on top and any machine that's connected to the network can interact with all other Deepens. So you really create that machine economy. So I must be honest, I think I invested in a project that's going to be taking on um, uh, where, um, uh, uh, HiveMapper, yeah. uh, doing, uh, I think they're going to be using your chain, right? Absolutely. Natix is the name and it's a, such a cool deep in use case because you can download an app and when you drive around, you basically put your phone at the front and you, it, it notices all the events happening on the street. So you can map the real world in real time, crowdsourced extremely valuable data and it scales super fast because it's a mobile phone deep So the reason why I liked them, the reason why I invested was because they did it using a mobile phone. So you needed no hardware. And we want to build the most profitable community in the world. And they can just put their own phones on their own dashboards and earn tokens for mapping. What could be easier? Exactly. That's super low friction. Everyone can join because almost everyone has a smartphone. And this is how Deepin will reach millions of users. And Nadix is one of those cases where millions of new people come to Web3 and yeah, create value. So listen, as you guys know, we want to make you guys rich in crypto. It doesn't only have to be through trading. We're going to work with Peak. We're going to support them. And every time a project launches where you guys can earn tokens by doing things, we're going to bring it to you guys. All right, guys, let's carry on with our tour because we've got a long way to go. Let's go. In addition to Deepin, AI, and RWAs, we also talked privacy with Top, who, after much anticipation, showed us a demo of their product. And if this product works, it could really revolutionize privacy in crypto. Great, so I see Walid here from Dup. Walid, yeah, nice to you. see you. Nice T tell me what I saw in that demo that you guys just did. Basically, this was the first time we revealed the DOP, DOP mainnet. It had three factors, encrypt and decrypt. And encrypt is your way into the system where you bring funds from a public blockchain inside the protocol, where the, you can use the send feature to interact with all other users in this protocol without revealing your crucial information like your balances, assets, your public address. And then the last feature, the decrypt, is where people, when wanted, can get out of the system and take their funds, their data, outside to the public block. Amazing. Listen, brother, well done. Thank Congratulations. You. It was an amazing demo. Thank you. And I'm glad that a lot of people saw it. There was a lot of excitement. Yes. We'll see you again soon. Thanks. All right, we're going back to the set. I see my friend Tim here at the set. Tim, tell us, what are you working on these days at Yield App? Yeah, absolutely. So recently we just launched our uh, Angel Angel Launchpad with, with Yield App. So uh, we got a first launch going on right now. Um, it's, it's you know, pretty hot. We're working with a really exciting uh, project in uh, Me3. And uh, yeah, it's... A, How do we access it? Uh, Yield App. So go to yield.app. Uh, you can sign up, register, uh, onboard with us. And uh, it's available now through and it closes next week. And then just look for the Launchpad. Absolutely. Good to see you, brother. All right, good to see you, Ryan. Good luck. Thank you. Well, it wasn't just launch pads that I set. We had friends, 
fans, family, and even George from Crypto as Us stopped by. George, good to see you here. I see you starting to do the conference scene a lot more. Yes. You used to be a lot more like not in the conference scene. Now I see you everywhere, bro. First time I'm in Dubai and we get, what, the worst rain in 75 years? <laughs> Based on your YouTube reactions, yeah. are we in the full bull market yet or not oh, yet? No. Nowhere close, nowhere close. This, this cycle is different. I'm, I'm sure you know, we're led by the institutions. Bitcoin is going up. A lot of alts are not. And I think a lot of retail investors, they're kind of like in a weird spot right now. They're excited because they see Bitcoin going up, but a lot of their alts are still down 50, 60%, right? So we're definitely not in full blown, like the parabolic phase of this cycle, but the halving event is coming. Would you be allocating a lot more to alts now? Given that Bitcoin's had such a fantastic run, like Bitcoin's been amazing, alts haven't performed as well. Would you now start saying, look, maybe a little bit more into alts? I've always devised the 50, 25, 25 rule. 50% in Bitcoin, 25% in big caps, 25% in everything else. So 50% alts, 50% Bitcoin. I don't think people should deviate from that. We don't know. The alts may come back, but Bitcoin can continue to be strong and go up to the moon. We, it's hard to say. Let's talk about the other 25%. Yeah. Favorite layer one other than uh, Ethereum? Oh, I'm not a fan of Ethereum at all. So what's your favorite layer one? Uh, Solana. I think Solana's go flip Ethereum this year. Favorite AI token today? Whatever the new merge company between Fetch, Singularity, and Ocean, I think the new token is ASI. I think that'll be interesting. Three powerhouses into one major company. I just don't know what it's gonna look like after it's done. There's the alpha from George. Are you trading meme coins? Of course, I'm trading money. If you don't trade meme coins, you don't make money, man. What's your alpha? What's your angle? Is it time to buy? It's a good time to start scaling in, I'd say, yeah. Looking back at the sunsets, we can bring you all this alpha, all these insights, all this first-hand knowledge from the industry's best and brightest. Hoddle. Oh, hoddle. <laughs> uh, not worried. Are you buying more? Yes. No other channel can do it like we do every single day and in real life from the biggest conference event of the year right here in Dubai at Token 2049. Now you've got all the info. Go and do your research. And as I always say, Trade well, my friends.